So thank you for joining me tonight uh, for the artistic vision of Gustav Klimt with Catherine Zupsik. Um, there was a very interesting article in Ion Sun Valley that described it as a pornographic presentation at the Haley Library. So I hope you aren't here and your, your, um, your anticipation will be dashed. We'll see. Uh, like I said before, Catherine, this is her fifth or sixth presentation for us, I think. Um, but she has been an art educator for 25 years, working as a docent and lecturer for the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, the de Young Museum, and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. She specializes in modern art, from Frida Kahlo to pop art to the fine art of the tattoo. A native of Portland, Catherine has a degree in Spanish and Latin American literature from the University of Oregon and a diploma from La Varenne, a renowned cooking school in Paris. She and her husband divide their time between Ketchum and a farm in Glens Ferry, Idaho. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Zupsik. Thank you very much. It's interesting, last time I spoke here, it was about the art of the time of Jane Austen, and there are about four people here. So this is what happens when it's advertised as pornography. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so today I am going to be talking about Gustav Klimt, whose art is some of the most recognizable in the world. Um, but what is it about him? that we find so alluring? Is it the gold, the glitter? Is it the way he represents women? He painted almost exclusively women. Is it the way he can depict a sense of bliss, a sense of love, and a sense of eroticism? It's so unexpected for his time. And then, oh, I thought I had one of his landscapes there, but we, he makes magnificent landscapes that we will also take a good look at that a lot of people love very much. <clears throat> he himself did not consider himself a great fine artist. He, um, <clears throat> he never made artistic manifestos. He didn't even keep a diary. He wrote nothing about his ideas of art. The only quote we have from him is, there is nothing special about me. I am a painter who paints day after day from morning to night. Whoever wants to know something about me ought to look carefully at my pictures. So that's what we'll do tonight. So in, in spite of, uh, he's, he's always, the critics have always been back and forth, up and down about Klimt. Some say that he is a mere decorative painter. And, but then in our time, recently, two of the highest prices that have ever been paid for paintings have gone for Klimt paintings for these two. So tonight I'm going to talk about his art and a lot about his life as well, starting with his early years. He was born in 1862 in the outskirts of Vienna. His father was a Czech then called Bohemian, a Bohemian um, immigrant. And he was, a, he was a gold engraver and supported his wife and seven children on this very paltry um, income that he was able to make. So here is Gustav when he was a young, very young man. This is, the family was very poor. This is one of the places they lived for a while. It's an abandoned railroad station that they just kind of squatted in there for a while. Um, Klimt, Gustav, was embarrassed to go to school because he was, he, his clothes were so terrible, he stayed out for a full year because he didn't have appropriate trousers to wear to school. But he drew constantly. He and his brother Ernst helped their father in this gold business, which is interesting because he's going to use so much gold in his, in his paintings, right? Um, and he drew constantly. His father recognized his talent and scraped together what he could to send Gustav and his brother Ernst to art school, not to the very fine Vienna art school of fine art, but to the more practical school of applied arts in Vienna. So a really so this is kind of industrial arts, but in a stroke of fabulous luck for the Klimts, 
at this time, this school was extremely progressive. It was copying the applied art schools in England, where the idea was that to be good at industrial arts, you had to understand fine art. So that they had classes in architecture, painting, drawing, sculpture. And Klimt was extremely gifted at drawing. This is a, a drawing he made at 17 from a live model. I mean, this is just absolutely masterful. And although his style will change and not be so realistic over time, he will always paint directly from a live model. So another stroke of luck for Klimt was ju that just as he and his brother graduated from school, Vienna was being completely rebuilt, the downtown part. How many of you have been to Vienna? Have some of you been there? I have actually not been. But this whole, I think it's pronounced Ringstrasse, this, which means Ring Street, um, that has all the big government, beautiful public buildings, was just being built at this time. And they desperately needed, they would hire students, graduates from this applied art school to decorate the buildings. And so Klimt and his brother Ernst started their own little art company where they would do commissions. And they were really good at it. And they landed this enormous commission, which was given by the Emperor Joseph of, of Austria. It was just such a huge deal that they got this. And their job was to paint these ceilings, these scenes on the ceilings. Um, here you see one of Klimt's painting. So you see how magnificent he is at this realistic academic style of painting, it's called. He, what his job was to, it was to be about theater because he's, this is inside a theater. So this is the painting he did of um, uh, Shakespearean theater. And you can see right here, so he's got the play going on over here. Here he's painted Queen Elizabeth the first watching, and then he's painted himself in that big ruff right behind her. That is the only self-portrait we have of him. He never made self-portraits. So, so that's it. Here's a little bit of a close-up. Again, just to show you his skill. He and his brother, here I'm gonna go back for a second, they were just terrified at the opening of this building that their art would, wouldn't be accepted um, well. But the Viennese just went crazy for what they had done, and they became celebrities. They were young, they were really handsome in this kind of working guy kind of way that all the, all the women were just crazy about them, so they got another commission. This time at the um, Art History Museum, um, in this big staircase area, and their job this time is to paint just these little areas between the um, between those columns there. And this time the theme is, for the Art History Museum, the history of art. And so Klimt's idea is to personify different, use women, female figures, to personify different periods of art. So this would be ancient Greek art. She is posing as Athena, the goddess Athena. This would be, you can guess, by the background, Egyptian art, which is kind of funny because Egyptians never, ever showed a full nude figure. Um, and then this would be very early Renaissance art. So what a difference, huh, between the style of his first commission and the style he's using now. That's because he has started looking at other artists. He is now looking at the English painters who are, I mean, this is the arts and crafts time. These are the pre-Raphaelites. And they are, what they are doing is all the artists in this time, the late 1800s, are rebelling against this style that they've been painting for years, you know, centuries. And so in France, it's the Impressionists who are the rebels. In England, it's these pre-Raphaelites. And their idea is to make these paintings that are about craft, about things that could be handmade in this age that has become completely industrialized. Especially, remember, the Industrial Revolution starts in England. So that's what they are talking about. So these paintings, oh, one, the main artist from this time would be Rossetti. 
And so the, the look is extremely detailed, mm -hmm. very detailed. But then with these touches, like her necklace that would be handmade by an artisan, um, her, ear, her hair ornament, another handmade touch, another painting by him were these fabrics, these beautiful fabrics. This is the time of William Morris. You know, so those fabric designs. Um, and this vase is another artisan element that they're copying. So in these, so here we see Klimt has done a fabric, and he's done all this gold work, uh, which would be artisanal as well. So he is doing really well. But in, when he turns 30 years old, he has a crisis. First of all, his father dies, leaving him at the age of 30 to completely care for his mother and two unmarried sisters, which he will do faithfully for in his entire life until he dies at the age of 55. His brother Ernst dies, and he is also responsible for Ernst's wife, and he loses his partner. Um, and so here he is, about that age, about 30 years old. And then he's having, he, at this age, by the age of 30, he had fathered 14 illegitimate children. He was just a notorious philanderer. I mean, this is really pretty terrible because these women, you know, it ruins them forever to have had a baby out of wedlock. But so he, he's just such a philanderer. Um, and the one relationship he has that's, that's serious is with Emily Floga, who is his sister-in-law. Um, and he will have a loving partnership with her probably not sexual. We don't know. Nobody knows this for sure throughout his whole life. She's a fantastic fashion designer, and I'll show you some of her work a little bit later. This is his painting of her. But he also has an artistic crisis. I'm showing you this painting of The Scream by Edvard Munch because this was painted at exactly this time when these artists are just having these crises that art they used to make was about big, important themes, the academic art. It was about history and um, mythology. Now they don't know what to paint. They want to paint things that are important, that have meaning in, in modern life. And so it causes a crisis for all of them. So uh, Klimt is one of the people who will start the Vienna Secession, which will be the, the Viennese um, answer to what to do instead of this academic art. Here they are. This is the group of artists who become the Vienna se Secession. You can see they're rebels. They're posing crazily uh, to be different than the stuffy academic artists and how they would pose for a group photo. Can you find Klimt? Do you see him? Yes, yes, in the throne. In the throne, wearing a robe, wearing some kind of a um, important robe. And then they've included these two workmen up there uh, laughing at this whole scene because they think it's all kind of funny too. But they will become the big modernist movement in Austria. Um, this is, so this, you know, he never wrote statements about what he believed, but he painted statements. This is Klimt's statement. Nuda veritas, the naked truth. So he shows this nude woman um, holding up a mirror to society. Hmm? And this was absolutely hated by the critics. But, oh, excuse me. This, this is what it says up on top. It's, a, it's um, by Schiller. It says, if you cannot please many with your art, then please a few. To please many is immoral, his new motto. So just a few years earlier, everybody loved this painting. What's the difference? They're both nude. Pardon me? Exactly. This one is completely idealized and stylized. It isn't even showing any detail, is it? Whereas, so she, and she's not from this time. She's from a distant past, a different place. The other one is just like your next door neighbor standing there naked. Um, body hair, things, you know, they've never even shown. They say that men used to get married after looking at nudes, millions of nudes, and they didn't actually, they were shocked when they saw body hair. 
They didn't know it existed. <laughs> so the Vienna Secession also, so they build this beautiful, modern building with this gold dome on top that looks like leaves, a big dome of leaves. This is the entryway, the, the heads of the three uh, Gorgons, dangerous, seductive, right there as you walk through the door. And their first event is going to be what we would, is kind of like, their opening event is kind of like a 60s happening. They decide to have this multi, um, multi, uh, this, uh, they, uh, the event that has music. It's going to be dedicated to Beethoven. So they're going to have an orchestra playing Beethoven. They're going to have 25 painters painting. They're going to have sculptors working on the spot, all sorts of things like this. And this is what Klimt makes, his Beethoven frieze. That building is still there in Vienna, and this, this um, frieze is still there in the uh, basement. So it's going to go around the room. And it starts out, so I'm going to start showing it to you from over here. It starts out with these three figures who are called the genii. They are like the spirit of, of life. And they are flying along, searching for what will bring human happiness and fulfillment. So first they encounter um, humanity, desperate humanity, begging for happiness. And can you make out that there's a knight here? It's hard to see because the background is so similar. He's wearing a gold armor. So this is his foot. This is his arm sticking out. And then his head is just below the two women's heads up above. So <clears throat> the, they're pleading with the knight to help them. And so moving forward, the knight encounters evil in the form of these three nude gorgons with snakes for hair. Of course, Medusa is the most evil of the three. And this horrible monster in the middle, um, they encounter gluttony, lust. Let's look at lust. There she is. He almost always represents lust with red hair. And then they keep flying along in search of happiness. They come across this figure with a lyre, so playing music that represents music and poetry, and then they line up and they meet this chorus and they all start swaying and singing because they have found the key to everything, which is basically sex. <laughs> this couple in, you know, locked in union, in transcendent uh, ecstasy, uh, with their water swirling around their feet and the chorus singing around them. I mean, you can just imagine Beethoven's Ode to Joy playing as, at, as this finale. So um, everybody came to see this artwork. And the critics had a few things to say about Klimt's part in it. Obscene art, orgies of the nude, painted pornography, pathological fantasies, revolting and obnoxious to all conventional notions of beauty. So he is absolutely crushed. And about the same, same time, he does another big, uh, uh, big artistic program for a university with these same kind of themes, these same ideas, and a lot of nudity that is just completely shot down as well. So he paints a painting that is kind of to his critics, he calls it. <laughs> and then he goes away. He isolates himself. He never really does, he never does public art again. Um, it was too disturbing to him. So he actually, here he is at home. He starts wearing these kind of Arab caftan robes and strolling around his garden. And we have a picture of this because the press comes and takes these pictures of him in this garden. And so now he's going to start doing easel paintings. Um, and unbelievably, he does really, really well. He has fantastic patrons in Vienna. There are ex extremely wealthy people um, who are progressives, especially the Jewish community, are very progressive and highly educated and very interested in forwarding culture. 
So they support him. They will buy anything he paints. Then he, they commission portraits for themselves from him as well. There's another picture of him. And so that's where the kiss comes from. It's, uh, this is one that he, it was not commissioned. He just painted it. So it's, it's forwarding some of these ideas that he had before. This couple is in, they're just kind of floating, aren't they, in this darker green, which looks like the cosmos. They're in the cosmos. And um, they are, he's not going to show those nudes anymore. So he's covering them up. He's covered them, covering them up with beautiful, uh, he's called a symbolist, beautiful fabrics that have symbolic elements in them. He leans forward and kisses her, uh, grabbing her head. We think that he got the idea for this gold. He's actually putting gold um, leaf on, on the paintings. So, he went to Ravenna in Italy, which has, from the 7th century, 6th century, excuse me, so old, these beautiful early Christian mosaics that are all made of gold uh, tiles. You, here you can see them up close. How they catch the light, hmm? because they're slightly placed slightly differently. <clears throat> so that's what he is applying here. I was telling Kristen, when I was in college, you know, everybody had the kiss as a poster in their room. And everybody loved Klimt. And we, the rumor was, what everybody said was that they were doing, they were having sex. They were doing all sorts of things under this, <laughs> under these robes and things but that he was covering them up. And that isn't actually true, of course. So the, another interesting thing, this is he likes the square. So usually a portrait is like a portrait shape, you know, like on our computers, usually a landscape is is that shape, but he likes the square. So this is a six foot square. His paintings are big. And here's the, the close up. So for all the symbols that are in their robes, we see his ability to paint again now here, don't we, with these beautiful faces. Her just lovely face and the way he's taken her head in his hands and he has that really strong neck that is just, you can just feel his desire for her. It's beautiful. And then they're both crowned. Uh, he with laurels and she looks like, it's flowers, but it looks like stars around her head. Another large six foot square painting that he made um, is about death and life. So on the left, you see the personification of death dark and, you know, with a skull, but not with the scythe that we're used to seeing the green rip, rip, reaper with, um, but with a club, which seems even more threatening. Looking at this mound of humanity, painted in lovely colors, um, you know, mothers, babies, they are all ages. This, everybody is going to die. Everybody is going to be taken by this. So again, his feeling for humanity. The question was, do you think he distorts the body a little bit? Um, like, I think he does distort it sometimes, but this is weird because they're in a clump. You know, so we're just, we're seeing so little of her body because that fabric is in front of her and the baby. See what I mean? We're just seeing this little piece. So it looks, you have to look at these for a long time to actually make sense of them, of who is where. They're, they're in a muddle. You can, only, you can always identify the skin because he does this kind of mottled uh, look. Another thing about Klimt that's kind of interesting is other painters at this time are using, are doing paint, globs of paint all over. Mm -mm, not Klimt. He has what we would call a licked surface, like an ice cream cone, smooth, smooth as glass, except for some of his gold. Um, it's interesting. So, so he has decided to go inward as the way, uh, as the way to paint things that are meaningful. And that is, this is the time of Sigmund Freud, who of course is in Vienna. 
So the Viennese were more interested in this whole idea of the subconscious than anyone else in Europe. His portraits of women. So now these are, many of them are um, commissions. Portrait of a lady from 1884. So early on when we're seeing that more academic style, I find it just shocking how extraordinarily good he is at, at painting humans when he, when he didn't even, that isn't what he studied was academic art. Just extraordinary. Look at her ear, that pink ear and the way he's done her flesh, her, her beautiful hand on the back of that um, chair. But now, just a couple years later, he's going to start experimenting. So now he's got his square format. He's pushed her over to the side. Her face is in that realistic style, but then her dress is not. Her dress is starting to look kind of impressionistic or loosely painted, isn't it? And it's mysterious. Is she inside or outside? Are those flowers coming from a vase, or are they a plant? Because she's outside. He gives us this sense of mystery. And the way he's positioned her way off to one side is probably looking at um, Whistler. He copied, he took a lot from Whistler, probably including the composition here. This is, uh, doesn't quite qualify as a portrait. This is his painting of Judith with the head of Holofernes. Judith was, is a biblical Jewish heroine who saves her people from being destroyed in war by going to the tent of the Assyrian enemy general in the night, the night before the battle, seducing him and getting him really drunk and then cutting off his head. And so, she, which, which is interesting because she was a very respectable Jewish widow in her community. So you can see his head. She's got the head down here. There are hundreds of thousands of paintings of Judith with the head of Holofernes in art history. And usually she's cutting off the head. But here, this is the only one that actually shows her as seductive, very seductive, isn't she? Um, look at those. Her head is tipped back. Her eyes are clasped, half closed. Her lips are parted. And then the fact that what we see of her that's nude is blurry, which makes her even more alluring than if it were crystal clear. And then another interesting thing he's doing. So her body is 3D, but then the gold work he's making completely flat. He's mixing these two things up. He's got this ornamentation behind her head, and then he has a necklace that visually does not look like it's going around her neck. It looks like it's just a flat thing on there. So he's differentiating between these two ways of working. Um, it's always been suspected, suspected that the model for this was Adele Block Bauer, the model um, in this extremely famous portrait. Another big one, I think this one is seven feet square. And she was, she had this, she commissioned this for her parents for their anniversary. Her father was a very, uh, excuse me, her husband was a wealthy sugar magnet, so he could afford all this gold. This would be, have been an extremely expensive painting to make. So he's done this again. He's put a decorative element back behind her head. It gets more decorative back there. Her face and hands and shoulders are realistic. But then, what is she wearing? Is she What is that? A dress and a cape, maybe? Hard to say. And here we are seeing symbols. Oh, we think, oh, by the way, we think this is also from Ravenna, this uh, depiction of Empress Theodora, with, again, something behind her head, and then all of this, this abstract uh, decoration on her. This is what it looks like up close. Have any of you seen this? It's in New York now. It was in, um, in Vienna, but now it's in New York at the New Leaf Gallery. Um, and so the gold is, it's flat, so you can see the shape, you can see the bumps of the canvas underneath there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's different when you see it in person than you might imagine it would look. 
So let's see, I want to show you these symbols. You have eyes, that's the Egyptian eye of Horus, and also the eye of God, which is on our money, of course. Then he's got A's and B's, her initials, in the, um, in the fabric as well. So this is Adele Blockbauer. So, you know, it looks like her eyes are half closed, kind of sexually, but her eyes actually kind of look like that. Her eyes actually are a little bit like that. Yes? Yes, and I'll talk about that in just a second. This painting has a really interesting... Oh, he asked, this is the painting from the movie, isn't it? And I'll talk about that in just a second. It is. So this is Adele Blockbauer. When she had that portrait, when she commissioned it, she was 27 years old. It was taken immediately down to a big gallery in Vienna and displayed in the window. And she just became famous. Everybody loved this painting. Everybody wanted to see it. So now, interestingly, people are able to accept Klimt now. They really, really love his artwork. But then she would die um, at the age of 44 in 1920-something. So she would not be alive in 1938 when the Nazis came to her parents' house and stole this painting four other Klimt's, a whole bunch of other paintings as well, and this diamond necklace that he's painted her wearing, this elaborate diamond necklace. Um, there was a movie made about this, a book, The Lady in Gold, and a movie, Woman in Gold, about, <clears throat> excuse me, which is about Adele, Adele's niece. I'm trying to blank on her name, Anne Marie. I'm sorry, I can't remember who many, many years later in New York City decides she's going to try to get this, that painting back. It is the main attraction at the, at the uh, museum in, what's the name of the, the, it starts with the B, in the Belvedere. Okay, so the most prestigious, the main attraction. So of course, Vienna, Austria does not want to give this back. Her lawyer is just the son of a friend who's like a tax attorney or something. And amazingly, over time, they get this painting back along with several others. It's just a fantastic story. Um, and you can read it or you can watch Helen Mirren play her. So this gold period, we, we think it of so much about this gold period, but it was actually really short-lived, and he didn't make many paintings in gold. He just made about three or four. So after this, he never makes them again, but he will switch from gold to color. He'll keep making these portraits. In fact, this is Adele Block, uh, Blockbauer again a few years later, and you can see that he He's using a lot of the same elements, isn't it? We can still, her face and arms are realistic, but then she has all this decor around her now. He had seen Matisse paintings in 1909, paintings by Matisse and, um, and a few other artists came to Vienna. And so what Matisse, of course, is doing is using this bright color in ways that aren't realistic at all. Like, she would not have a green face or a patch of, you know, it's not realistic. In fact, sh this is his wife, Matisse's wife, who was wearing a black dress when she posed, and a black hat when she posed for this. But Klimt is going to pick up on these colors. The backgrounds are really interesting, too. He puts something in the background that he personally likes, but also that he thinks has something to do with the person. So these, he has these little Chinese warriors galloping across because he owned figurines of Chinese horses with, with uh, warriors on them. So that's what he's painting. But he felt that it expressed something about her personality. portrait of Rhea Munk. This one's interesting because it's unfinished, so you can kind of see his working process. Uh, this, is a, this was a young woman who died when she was 22. She committed suicide after a love affair, and her um, parents commissioned this portrait of her after she died, which is really lovely, the way that he has so sweetly surrounded her with flowers. 
it's unfinished because um, he, Klimt himself, died before he was able to finish it. Um, this is this portrait of Joanna Stoda is uh, is really well known too. You can see how he's getting looser, isn't he? The face is not looking as realistic and as academic as it was before. He's getting more and more modern. And then always these design elements. He continued to consider himself a designer, really a decorator almost, before an artist, before a fine artist even. So here he has these fabrics. Um, she was very, this is 1917, she's wearing a 1920s cut, years before it was actually um, acceptable. And I just, so here you can see that difference again, that astonishing difference in his style. Um, the designer, fashion designer Lorenz Scott would pick up on these, these clip portraits and design dresses uh, based on them. Here's Nicole Kidman wearing one, but without the, without the fur. Here are three more. You might recognize this one, this, the gold on top that was taken from that depiction of Athena that we saw early on. And then I haven't shown you the painting that goes with this third one, but they're just fantastic dresses. This isn't a portrait, this is just an anonymous woman. This is different than any of his other portraits because 1909 when he saw Matisse, he also saw Toulouse-Lautrec and was completely taken with him. So um, you can see the connection here. Uh, this is the only, this is very unique, this painting. Interesting white on white and how he has differentiated between the white background and her her body with lines and then painting in different directions. I put that in there for you, Virginia. <laughs> she was at my house and told me this was her favorite one in the book. <laughs> now, e Egan Sheila, right, Egan Sheila, who's 30 years younger, who's going to be Klimt's protege, um, painted after he saw this one by Klimt, painted this one, the sneering woman. Sheila was very raw and really sexual. Let's see, I think I threw a couple things in. Um, interesting, this could just be completely contemporary in our time, couldn't it? Uh, so, <clears throat> always kind of, I don't know, on the fringe looking characters and many very sexually explicit. You can see that his main thing is drawing. Hmm? Drawing is the root of his, of his art. Very raw, very agitated, most of his art. He, everybody had such high hopes for him to be one of the most famous artists of this time, but he died when he was only, I think, 27 of the Spanish flu in um, 1918. So now I'm going to show you these landscapes. Klimt would, remember, he's taking care of his mother and sisters, three and sister-in-law, three women, all this time. So during the winter, fall, and spring, he is in, uh, he's in Vienna doing these portraits, kind of living society life, which he didn't like. But in the summers, he would go up north to Lake Adersee. Is that how you say it? I've got an Austrian back here. Adersee. Um, and where he would spend the entire summer with his beloved Emily, his, his dearest, dearest friend. Um, so here they are out on the lake. So this is when he is relaxed and happy. You can tell this from the photographs. So, so Emily, her designs were, this is the time of corsets. You know, women are just stuffed in these corsets and these dresses. Her very forward thinking idea was to make things that were comfortable. These are some of her designs. And a lot of women, a lot of these progr this progressive moneyed elite in Vienna would wear her designs. In fact, let me just go back really fast. Sorry about this, I should have stuck it in there. This is one of her designs. So, you know, it, she's got a loose shawl over the top, but what you're seeing underneath isn't corseted. It's much more comfortable than that.
So even this very dressy dress on the left is, is looser. She's worth Googling and uh, reading about. She was a fantastic designer. Here you can see the difference. The woman in front is corseted, and that's Emily behind. Klimt, relaxed, happy during these summers with Emily and her family. So now he does start to paint landscapes. He, again, he prefers this square format. And they are not as, they aren't six feet square. They're more like four feet square. These tend to be. So um, his love of pattern and design is the most visible quality of these paintings. He's also now, by now, he's seen Monet and how Monet painted water with just those brush strokes and is copying that. I mean, talk about pattern, just solid pattern. And because he, he wants the pattern to be the main thing, so he isn't going to be showing us shadows, because shadows would start making the pattern, pattern look three-dimensional. He wants these patterns to look flat. Here he's probably looking at Van Gogh. He, he doesn't usually, Klimt doesn't usually have lines, outlines, you know, this drawing element, but you can see Van Gogh really did. And that's probably what he's thinking about here. Ooh, he's just extraordinary. And these are some of my favorites. He gets a telescope. And you know how, uh, how binoculars flatten everything, like everything looks like it's exact? Well, that's exactly what he's looking for. He wants everything to look like a flat design pattern. So he gets in his boat and he starts looking across the lake at the village over there through these binoculars and then painting what he sees as this flatness. There's a, a garden as well. So Klimt, in the summer of 1917, he didn't feel well, and he didn't make it uh, to the lake with Emily that summer. And then when he was just, just a few months later, when he was 55 years old, he had a stroke really young. And while he was in the hospital, the Spanish flu came through, and it, and it killed him. So he died when he was only 55 years old. And the last thing he said was, get Emily. She was the love of his life. So I'm going to leave you there with, with Klimt and this broad, interesting career that he had. I, to me, one of the most interesting things about him is, his, is that, that idea of design, of, you know, of decor, of pattern, of that never left him, and how um, it, even though sometimes the critics thought that it was too much decoration, in our time we don't, we don't feel that way at all. There's something about his artwork that just pulls us in. Would you agree? Um, so I would love to hear comments that you might have or questions. Pardon me? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes, it is. It, it, the question was, is it mostly oil on canvas? Yes, it is mostly oil on canvas. In fact, I think everything I showed you was oil on canvas except for the gold leaf. The kiss is still in Vienna. It is at the Belvedere, where the portrait of Adele Blockbauer had been. So it is still there. <clears throat> Did I show it? In the beginning, let's see. I'm going to just go back really fast. Yeah, I showed a few things in the beginning that I then didn't. 
talk about. I think you probably, well, did I show you this one? This one is called, sorry. This one is called the Virgin. And so it's like death. It's like the death one with this mass of humanity in a big blob, except they're all women. And she is the, is the Virgin. But she is surrounded by old women, younger women, women who've obviously had children, who obviously, but there's, there's this dreamy beauty about this one. And this one, you had said that, you know how you could, this one, you really can't find the body parts. You can only, you know when you see that color that you're seeing a knee or some piece of skin. But then you might have been talking about this. Right. This is called Girlfriends. So whoop, it's a portrait he did of, of two women friends of his who were lesbians. Pardon me? What it's hard to make out what it is. The comment was her body looks distorted. This is her arm. It's, her arm is going like this. Do you see what I, do you see what I'm saying? Her arm is reaching across. So, The common was there's there's sort of a Lucian Freud in what way? Yeah. Lucian Freud, uh, an English painter who does mostly portraits that are that tend to be really disturbing. Did he? <laughs> So any other comments or questions? It's just, it probably had meaning to him, but lots of times they're just things that are in his studio that are just, you know, he, that he just thinks are interesting back there in the background. Yeah, that bird and the flower. This to me looks like a phoenix or a dragon, something something more mythical, a bird snake combo, something. Well, thank you very much. You were just a wonderful audience. Thank you for coming. And I'm sorry it wasn't a little more pornographic. <laughs>